Good day, Bill. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me today over Zoom. Well, my pleasure. I would, thanks for uh, having me and a wonderful opportunity to meet and greet. Yeah, we have not met before. Uh, we've been connected on social media. And I just discovered a while back, not too long ago, that you and I weren't connected on LinkedIn, and we did fix that. But uh, I've had you on my list for a while to do this interview because I think that you come at this from a different angle than I did. You, you, but and so we'll learn a little bit more about that as we get into this. But I have a uh, five-part series of questions to try to introduce you to our audience. But let's start off with why don't you introduce and give us your name and tell us where you grew up. Well, William Ryan, uh, uh, we, I, we, Bill for short for friends. I was born in upstate New York. Uh, up along the uh, in the Adirondack Mountains, but uh, we moved down to Troy, New York, which is just uh, north of Albany on the Hudson River, uh, halfway through fourth grade, and uh, and then that's that's kind of where I spent the rest of my time through high school. Ah, and then where what did you where did you go off to college, and what did you study? I got my bachelor's degree. I got a bachelor of science at the uh, SUNY College of Brockport, and SUNY is the State University of New York system. And uh, in technical communications, which was uh, uh, radio and television production, and I took a lot of computer classes at the time. Uh, you know, it was one of those days when I, when I first started, we were actually punching cards, and eventually made our way uh, to the green screens. So uh, uh, I did that, and then I went to work for a little while. Uh, but then I had an opportunity, and and uh, and gambled on a year, and got my master's, uh, master science, from Ithaca College. And that was in corporate communications, but the focus was uh, on instructional design. And, uh, and then I, I uh, finished up with a, a PhD uh, from Nova Southeastern University, uh, Computing Technology and Education, which is basically distance learning. And, uh, and that was my academic travel. Mm -hmm. So where do you live now and, and what do you do? I'm currently uh, living outside of Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, I've been an independent consultant for seven years. I help organizations develop, engage, and retain their workforce using learning strategically. We uh, we moved down here in 2004, my family and I, and have enjoyed it tremendously. Mm -hmm. And so now let's uh, let's kind of fill in the gap between uh, getting out of college, getting your PhD, and what you're doing now. Can you talk to us a little bit about uh, your career progression, jobs, or positions you had, and any interesting projects that you experienced along the way? You know, it's, it's, it's been a, an interesting uh, road. Uh, I went to work for an AM uh, daytimer radio station right out of, out of college. And, um, and uh, but I was able to get into a professional internship and it was working with the hearing impaired. And I got to uh, work on open and closed captioning just as that became law in 1980. Um, and what was really interesting for me was it, it showed me where computers and video had a natural connection. And what it really showed me was the idea that you can use technology to expand access to information for people and of, of all kinds of different people. I mean, this is over time and distance. And that kind of led me down this, this path uh, of, of following some of the technology, but with the idea of how can we use it to expand access. Um, I went from you know, scraping boards. Uh, there was a, a company called BCD. It was a, a family name and they made cards that you could put into computers and, and, and you'd, you'd scrape them to put jumper cables so that the computer could, could control a videotape machine. And I had an Apple IIe and a Betamax <laughs> and made an interactive videotape program. And, uh, and that led me down to you know, interactive video discs, and then, you know, down through CDs, and, and then uh, uh, something called DVI, which was digital video interactive, and um, Intel had come out with it, and, and we were making uh, a video editing uh, using digital video, and, and this is in the, you know, the mid-1990s, so at the time, it was very, very novel, uh, but that also opened up the door where I got into some early learning management systems, like Lotus Learning Space, and then Blackboard, um, and then the whole video conferencing, you know, cycle of, you know, from satellite to internet protocol IP to the web-based kind of tools that we're using even today. And, and you know, the thing that I, I found, though, is, is that the, the technology keeps changing. 
And, and I've been very fortunate that I've been on some of the leading edges and, and had chances to experiment with some of it, but it's the, it's the techniques, the design characteristics that really are, are the most important and the most valid and, and ringed true through all of them, you know, things like, you know, interactivity, um, trying to engage people, uh, you know, chunking up information, assessment strategies that allow people to demonstrate, to remediate, and then blending the options to, to meet people, you know, where, when, and how they need support. That hasn't changed through it all. And I think that's one of the key parts of, of you know, what drives me today is how can we find the ways to meet people when and where they need and how can we help them at, at that point? Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. So uh, tell us a little bit more about what you're doing today and the kind of consulting services that you render to your clients. You know, what are you, are you doing the technical end? Are you doing analysis, design and development of content? What, what, uh, what areas are you working in right now? Well, you know, that's the nice thing about being in this role um, as a solopreneur. I, I can answer that to say yes. Um <laughs> And it's not really on, on purpose. Uh, it does happen I, in my career. So I, I, I've had one of those uh, strange uh, experiences where um, I was I was a VP of technology, the CIO. And at one point, I was also a VP of education, a CLO. So, you know, I have both of those skill sets and, and can apply them. So in different parts of my consulting services, I have worked with different kinds of, of organizations, uh, manufacturing, um, clinical, um, a retail space. Um, and in all of them, the issue came down to is we need to um, reach out to remote participants. And how are we gonna do that? So um, there's smaller organizations. So, you know, I come back and say, well, you know, there's multiple ways to do this. Here's a couple of options, you know, things from learning experience platforms, learning management systems, and, and, you know, depending on their price and their time, I've been able to help them put in place the, the platform that they need and then continue to develop the curriculum, to develop the content and the assessment strategies that they can then use to reach and support their users. So, you know, it's, it's been able to be, um, it's allowed me to kind of um, uh, meet both of my interests, looking, you know, staying current with the technology, but, but also focusing on the end user and, and the participant uh, that needs the, the support that they're trying to reach. Um, it's been really kind of interesting in that regard. Uh, so. Very good, thank you so much. Let me shift gears here a bit. Uh, the, the title of my video series is HPT Video. So HPT, Human Performance Technology, known by a, a wide variety of names over the decades. But uh, I think uh, what I sensed, what, one of the reasons I wanted to, to interview you is that you seem to be kind of a performance-oriented person. And you're not using the language that I might use, but that, that was my sense here. So. What I'm interested in now is uh, what was your first exposure to human performance technology or human performance improvement or evidence-based practices for whatever learning or performance improvement kinds of things? Um, I had two instructors at Ithaca, a gentleman named Steve Hines and, and Diane Gayeski, who were very influential uh, at that time, and, and uh, uh, Diane had, had actually has written a couple of books that had attracted me to go to Ithaca, even at, at the you know for my master's, and and the issue really came down to um, uh, you know instructional systems design. It was that kind of systematic um, methodology that allowed you to replicate success and help people perform consistently. And, and that and that was kind of the focus of the conversations. I mean, they gave me words. I, I understood, you know, my video background, my, my, my video experiences. I mean, I knew how to tell stories, but I didn't have the, the, the language of saying, what am I trying to help people do? And and that was kind of like, you know, the light went on over my head <laughs> to say, oh, <laughs> there's a way to do this and there's a way to, to do it. And, and when I went to work for IBM, their publishing subsidiary, SRA, um, they call this whole, you know, idea of, of um, systems approach to education. And, and we were doing self-study courseware at the time. That's 
interactive videotapes and and diskettes and video discs and those kind of things. And and that's where I saw, you know, the focus about helping people, you know, define what their success is going to be and how to measure it. And and that kind of led me to Thomas Gilbert's work and and you know the the, the term performance engineering um kind of was was one of those, you know, again, it was like, this just made sense. This is the way people are supposed to go. And when I think about um, uh, his behavioral engineering model, you know, that was kind of one of those, um, oh, this makes sense. How do we help people, you know, progress for the, these kind of things? And, and I have to admit, I kind of like the term HPI, you know, the human performance improvement more than the HPT, but that's my focus about in people, you know, the, the, in improving helping them improve their performance. You know, it, it, to me, it's, it's the focus of, of, of the person and their effort more than, you know, worrying about the technology that'll be there. You know, the high tech always is there, but the high touch I think is what we need that, that the support of the purpose uh, of the person is really that focus of the effort. Yeah. That technology word has been a stumbling block for uh, NSPI and ISPI. The technology used to refer to, the application of science, but they never really marketed it successfully as that. So HPT is kind of the means to HPI, if you will. But uh, but it's always been an issue, and there were people who argued for getting the H out, uh, kind of a joke. Uh, but because it's you know it's more than just the human variable; it's all the variables performance, and that's always been a struggle. But uh, so Diane was somebody that uh, I've known for a long, long time, and <laughs> she's been in this video series with me. I don't know Steve Hines, uh, but I but I know the name, but I just don't know him as a person. But uh, but uh, uh, yeah, that she would be inspirational, I think, uh, uh, in in getting people into a performance orient orientation to instruction and following that. But so besides those two people and Gilbert, who you mentioned, um, can you name for our audience here some of the people that were, you know, early in your career were influential to you, either people or books or articles, anything that you can point to that uh, they might want to follow up with? Well, Glory and Gary, uh, you know, had put out of things, especially, you know, the whole electronic performance sports system. Um, again, you know, earlier in my career, my focus was more on the technology mm -hmm. and, 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 um, and, you know, at that point in time, some of the technology was, was just coming out, you know, CDs and, and, you know, the, as I mentioned, the video discs. So, you know, trying to understand and, and maintain that level of, of competence in, in how to use the tools drove me a lot, uh, at the times, but, you know, she kind of took it to the next level. Of, of saying, yes, this is, this is, you know, here's the tools, but here are the, the reasons why. And again, it was all about how do you help people at that point in time of need? So um, uh, uh, she had an influence, um, a gentleman named uh, Dennis Mankin, he uh, with a company called um, Platinum Performance Partners, uh, had a lot of influence on my HBI growth at the time. You know, and, and that's how I found you. I mean, I, you know, people that were talking about lean ISD, I know I still have that book that you put out. <laughs> um, you know, it was it was you know it was it was the things that that I, I read about, and and I think that you know those were some of the I, I think it was the theme more than some of the people is the idea of of, of um, the systematic approach to um, solving problems. You know, the whole backwards design model. You know, is one of those that, that I still, you know, like help people and have a conversation about is, you know, if you really want to help somebody, you know, let's define what you want them to be able to perform. Let's define what success is and then identify the things that, that measure that success so that, you you know, that builds your assessment strategy. But that also provides the the metric that, you know, the operational partners can use and that the individual can use to see if they're actually, you know, improving and, and, and working safer, faster, more efficiently, whatever those, you know, success factors are. And I think, you know, that's one of the reasons I like Twitter. Um, I know it gets kind of a bad rap, but, but, you know, for me, if, you know, you hashtag keywords like, you know, instructional design, um, lean ISD, if you're, you know, performance improvements, and you'll, you'll, you'll see this, this wealth 
of, of information and resources about people that are talking about this and doing it. And, and I think, you know, the people that have been, you know, publishing in ISBI and, and ATD over the years um, have been, you know, you can go into their stacks and just look on those keywords and you will find so many people that have, have case studies that have examples and, and can look and say, you do this and it'll help you, your people succeed. Thank you for that. Um, and my next question is a, is a bit of a shift here, but in, to provide an example to the audience, especially the people that are kind of new to the field here, uh, can you give us a 30 second elevator speech on what you currently do? Sure. <laughs> Of course I can. Huh? I've learned that. <laughs> I, pro I provide organizations solutions to develop high-performing people in the workflow using learning and performance tools strategically with the goal of improving engagement, driving retention, targeting people, processes, and platforms that impact the business. In other words, I help support people's performance at the place and point of need. Very good. Very good. Thank you. A lot of people struggle with answering that and give me several minutes worth. But uh, but it's one of the jokes, that the uh, kind of an inside joke at NSBI, ISBI, that we have a very difficult time explaining to other people what we do. And uh, it would always resonated with me because my relatives would, would question, you know, what is it that you really do? How <laughs> help people learn their jobs when you've never done it? And things like that. Anyway, so thank you for that example. As a lifelong learner, can you share with us any anything about your current focus of learning? What are you focused on, and are you writing about it? Is there it, where people can access that and see what you're up to? I do post on LinkedIn. I'm on Twitter as well. Uh, Twitter's more uh, just fun and informational. Um, I kind of write a couple of times a week on LinkedIn. You know, things that that I think about. I mean, that I I, uh, I spend a little more time. Uh, analyzing and and and, uh, and kind of trying to provoke conversations and thought. Uh, so please follow me on on either of those platforms, and I'd love to connect and, and have that additional conversation. Um, but most recently, you know, it's, I just I, I just uh, finished a book on uh, called Exponential Organizations uh, by Salim Ismail. I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly. If not, my apologies. Um, and I'm, I'm currently reading uh, a book called The Workplace um, Curiosity Manifesto by Stefan van Hoendoink. And again, apologies for mispronouncing names. Um, and I see the two of them having a really interesting uh, blend of, of impact to this whole idea of impacting human performance. Um, you know, our, our, especially in this kind of fluid hybrid you know, workplace that we're in today. Um, the issue of, of our, our own path of discovery from how to work differently, how to work with people differently, how to get our work done differently, how to, how to live differently for, you know, I mean, the, all of those things are part of the discovery process and, and that's driven by curiosity. Um, and it's got to move quickly because our work kind of demands it. It's got to move flexibly because we're kind of demanding it. And, and I see those two kind of ideas coming together. Um, in the exponential organization, um, they use an acronym called IDEAS, and I had to write it down because I couldn't remember it. So but I, I, what I like about it was that it, it brought together, you know, these key kind of words. And one was about um, interface and process. One was about dashboards, you know, again, measuring what, what's important, experimentation, autonomy, and social technology. And, and to me, it's, it's those issues of, of those tools being used to connect people at a time and a distance. It's being able to communicate. It's being able to measure um, and see that what you're doing has impact. And, and I look at those kind of things and think about the work that we're doing and how it can have impact and the, um, to the person, to the individual. Um, so I, that's, those are the, the two current reads I'm doing. Um, I'm, I am very slowly uh, working on, on a book myself. Um, and it's, it's, it's the same idea of learning how, of, of seeing how we can translate our efforts in performance 
and, and aligning them into more of a competency-based model. Um, uh, Gilbert talked early on about competence and it always resonated with me because of the work that I have done through my years is, you know, you want people to be able to demonstrate to their, to a defined level of proficiency. And I think that there's, you know, how do we get to that level of mastery of both, you know, technical knowledge and business behavioral skills and help people expand and improve their capabilities to be successful in their roles. So, you know, I think those are, are things that, that we can bring out while showing that return on that learning, that investment um, has an impact to the bottom line. And I think that's one of those opportunities uh, that sometimes many of us in, in the field have uh, don't see right away is, is how we should be able to uh, measure that impact and, and partnering with our business partners to, to uh, um, show that bottom impact and, and, and show that it really is a return on learning. Here, here, thank you for that. Uh, that that's so important. I hear shades of Gilbert through a lot of it and, uh, and a lot of other people too. Um, there are many, many people who are uh, thinking and, and, and performing in, in a similar vein uh, in the work that they do. It's just that we're still uh, a minority, I think, in the field. And uh, I hope that uh, videos like this will help uh, change that kind of thing. And I will be putting your the, your uh, various links to you on Twitter and LinkedIn and, and your website, et cetera, in the show notes and in a blog post that I'm going to put up tomorrow. Uh, let me uh, shift gears here again and ask you about language, terminology, is there a performance improvement term or phrase that you would like to define for us? Perhaps you feel it's being misused or misconstrued and you'd like to put your own spin on it, but language is a huge issue across our field, I think. And so here's an opportunity for you to take a whack at uh, some of that. Um, Clark Quinn just uh, uh, posted something on his blog about language in our field. Um, I, I recommend you go read it. Um, and and, it, and it's funny because uh, I don't really have a term that bothers me. And, and, and that's because I've, I've been fortunate to have moved in different parts of our country for different jobs and realize that there are, um, we can call something, there's different names in different parts of the country for the very same object. Um, uh, and, and so it, to me, it's about just clarifying up front. Uh, so I've never really worried about it, but I do think that um, more to Clark Quinn's post was that I think sometimes in the, the, the learning and development people, even the term learning and development, you know, is, should we be performance? Should we be, you know, learning? Should we be training? You know, I, I think sometimes we forget um, uh, that we're here to support and serve others. Uh, I will say one of the beauties of, of, of being in this particular solopreneur kind of role now as a consultant is, is that I, I do the same kind of work, you know, across multiple verticals. You know, somebody said, well, what's your niche? And my niche is helping people, you know, perform better. I don't care what industry you're in. And that's sometimes a, I think we forget sometimes that, you know, we do have to care about the industry if we're in one and, 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 and using their language, we can translate in our heads, you know, they don't have objectives. They just want people to perform this. They want them to be able to demonstrate their capability to do this, um, you know, whatever that is, whatever the widget we're making. So, you know, okay, that means they need, you know, in our brains, we can say, okay, you know, here's the objective, you know, here's the, here's the, here's the words we have to use in our heads to get to that point. But our business partners don't care. So I, I think it's more about um, having active communications with the people we're working with and supporting uh, more than any kind of specific term. I think that's very valid and, and, and uh, insight for people that, that we need to learn to speak the language of our clients, uh, their industry language, their company language, and it does vary <laughs> within a company from location to location sometimes. And we can get trapped by that, but our clients most often don't want to understand, you know, how we make the sausage. Yeah, they, they, just want, they just want it done and done quickly and done well. And yeah. uh, 
it's too too often I think that people come in and they feel like they have to explain what it is we do and how we do it to our clients, and they're really not interested. I but I've had clients ask me about it after they've experienced some of it and they wanted to know more, and that's when you do that when they've expressed interest and they're asking you those kinds of questions. But but otherwise, yeah, I think the language all too often inhibits us. But for new people coming in, I think it's important for them to understand what you said is that the language varies and we can use different words to, for the same thing. And, you know, such something like performance support or what Gloria Geary called electronic performance support systems, you know, that's been known by many, many different names. Job aids was one, performance aids is another one, that back in the 60s and 70s, it was called guidance. And I'm sure that before, you know, learning and development kind of folks got a hold of it. It was called something else in some other discipline. So I've always felt that one of the things that, that um, A, I'm good at, but I felt that it's something we should do more of within our, our learning profession is, is, is be translators. And, um, and, and I'm very fortunate because, you know, again, having a, that kind of technical background and as well as the learning background, you know, there's a time where I can go into an, in, you know, a situation and, and literally I can hear the IT people talking one language. I can hear the HR people talking another language. I can hear the operational people talking another language and they're all saying the same thing. And I can hear it and I can come back and go, oh, hey, what they mean is, and I can put it in their terms. And I think sometimes that, that when we can help translate um, and facilitate the conversations, we can smooth things out and, and bring align people to the purpose that, that they're all, they all have good intentions. Um, and a lot of times it's, it's learning how to ask the right questions to bring out those, those um, conversations. Um, you know, a lot of times when I get involved in a, in a with a client, uh, you know, I'll come back and I say, let me talk to the to the technical people. Let me talk to the IT posts, because sometimes there are resources they don't even know exist. Um, when I came uh, to Louisville, um, I was working for a, a large health insurance company. And the one of the situations came up where we wanted to be able to think about using shared content objects. And, you know, there's a whole discussion about content repositories and all this other stuff. And I just kind of went knocking on a door and said, you know, we have call centers and they have policies and procedures and scripts. Where do you guys put all this stuff? And they went, oh, well, we have, you know, this massive tool that we bought a few years ago. And I said, is there space for us? <laughs> and we'll support these things. And they went, oh, sure. Nobody ever asked us. <laughs> so instead of having yeah. to buy something, you know, I could just say, hey, Come on, let's go over there. And I, I think that's one of those things that that when we think about the terminology, it's it's you know if, if we don't know how to ask the questions, you know, um, then people won't know to volunteer. And if we can help, as I said, translate, facilitate those conversations, I think it brings us into helping people perform more efficiently and and shows our value. Exactly. Exactly. Great. Great story. All right. Let's shift gears again. All right, so my next question, the second to the last question I have for you is, who are some of the more recent uh, people or books or articles that you might point our audience to, assuming that they've been in the field, maybe they're just entering the field or been in for a while, but so what are you finding of interest? You've mentioned a couple things already, but, uh, but who are some of the people that you would recommend that they follow? Uh, again, or other resources that they might look at? Um, I highly recommend uh, Harold Jarsh. Uh, his uh, PKM, uh, personal knowledge model, uh, I think has great impact and and uh, uh, fascinates me. Um, big fan of Jane Hart. Um, uh, Mark Britz, uh, what he's doing with some of the social media uh, connecting and and uh, business practices. Uh, he and Paul uh, Jocelyn, you know, make me think, which is really good. Um, I mentioned Clark Quinn. Um, I'd say Terry Hart and Will Pymeyer are all you know leaders in 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 this industry and 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 provoking a lot of ideas. And and you know, again, I I, I highly recommend you know. 
getting onto the, the various social media channels and and, uh, and and hashtagging, you know, the keywords because there are so many people that are just coming out of the woodwork with with new research and you know they're on ISPI and they're certainly in ADD and and publishing and sharing and and we can all be grateful for that. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you. So my final question. Uh, And thank you for doing this interview for me. But my final question to you is, what advice would you have for people that are entering the field? What guidance might you give them? I think the biggest thing is um, listen to the client and ask questions. You know, whether you follow the five whys or, 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 or other techniques, you know, don't, don't take everything for granted. I think, especially as you're entering the field, you, you believe that you're, you know, the people coming to you with a problem know what the problem is. And that's not always true. Um, there's times where, you know, people have come down at, at a point where, you know, we need training, we need training. And if you, if you dig into the data, sometimes you'll say, no, it looks like you have one or two people that are not doing well, but the other 30 in this you know, pod are doing fine. Let's take those one or two offline and train them. Sometimes it's, it's about performance support. You know, procedures could be out of date. Um, sometimes it's, it's ergonomics. Uh, I worked uh, you know, recently at a manufacturing plant where they had changed out some equipment. And it was, it was updated and new equipment, but you know, the waste was going up. And the problem was the systems were different. It was just physically had changed. And people that had been doing this kind of work for you know, a decade or longer were just having a hard time figuring out you know, muscle memory was, you know, we just reached over into this. Well, you don't do that anymore. And, and it was an ergonomic issue and, and really working with them on that. It wasn't a training issue. They knew how to do what it was. Um, so so you know, one thing is, is listen and then analyze to see what the real problem is and realizing it might not be training and the other thing is is the other thing that i think we we don't spend enough attention on is what is the metrics of success to the business partner to the operational people not us you know i i don't care about scores I don't care about how many clicks. I don't care how many courses are offered or how many sections or how many people. What really matters is what does the solution do? Does it move that business needle? So, you know, get people to define how they measure that success and then find out what that is before you implement a solution and then keep measuring it after you implement the solution. Measure what matters and then you can track and trend. And, and, and that provides you uh, a degree of reliability and, and validity to your business partner, to your client, because you can, you can come back and say, I'm noticing the numbers aren't going the right way. Let's, let's modify quickly. So you're not waiting for months. You're not waiting for a long point in time. You're looking at short times, but you're using their measures. And that means everything to them. And that shows, again, the return on learning. So those are the, the two things that I would, I would like to you know, focus on and, and say, if you're coming into the field, it's a fascinating field. And, and there's nothing better than watching people succeed. Yes. Thank you for that advice uh, on behalf of our audience. And uh, again, thank you so much for agreeing to do this video interview with me. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to finally have a chance to, to meet you face to face. We have we certainly have, have uh, learned from each other and I appreciate all the things that you've shared through the years. And thanks for this opportunity. You're most welcome. You have a great day. You too. Bye bye.